Good morning. May it please the Court. Paul Feltman on behalf of the appellant, uh, Mr. Escano, I'd like to reserve two minutes of my time. Um, we're here on a abusive discretion standard with regard to the exclusion of certain evidence at the time of trial. Not just certain evidence, it actually was all evidence of damages and causation and the striking of our sole expert witness um, on that issue. Well, the, the issue of damages is is the amount of damage itself is really, for me, not a problem because your expert had uh, an, a, an affidavit or a, a, a list of an estimate where he had detailed the cost of the different repairs and replacements and it came to $50,000. With regard to his testimony after his second visit, of course, that was properly stricken, I, I believe. But I've read this transcript four times. And I have a problem with causation based on his testimony. It appears, tell me where I'm wrong in this transcript, that the witness was only able to tie the damages he estimated to causation by Hurricane Wilma from his second undisclosed trip to the home. If that's true, then where's the causation? Where's anything that ties his estimate to causation by Wilma? Well, the original estimate was done at the time that he went out to the property the first time. But he testified, I, I talked to the homeowner. I didn't get any, I didn't take any photographs. I didn't go, go pull any information on the house to know when, what the condition of the roof or the condition of the home was. And I... Uh, threw away my notes, and um, it looks like he says, I don't, it looks like when he's finally on cross, he concedes that the only way he was able to, to recall that those things he listed or, or tie them up to Wilma was his subsequent trip to the home, which was stricken. Am I wrong about that? Um, actually, he never really got to that point because what happened at the time of the cross-examination was he was shown one picture, which he said that he originally, during his deposition, didn't recall that there was chalking on the wall. And the opposing counsel then said they want a sidebar. Because he impeached him and said, you your deposition. You said you couldn't determine that. And we went sidebar. and. He said, listen, I sent a letter a month before the trial saying if he's changed his opinion, which he hadn't, his opinion was the damages were caused by the hurricane, um, I want to retake his deposition. Their expert had gone out also and taken a look at the property prior to trial. And so based upon that one letter, and um, my business partner, Mr. Alvarez, who's with me, was trying to call one of our partners, Mr. Gomez, to find out if we had even received that letter. It wasn't a formal subpoena or anything like that. Um, the judge struck all of his testimony, his estimate as to the damages and as to the um, it being caused by the hurricane and um, the sworn proof of loss, which he subsequently would not allow in under any circumstances, that, and it was an agreed exhibit. And so he never really even got a chance, I think, to get to some of the issues that you may be talking to, but he certainly did talk about uh, his estimate, his damages, and that estimate set forth what the damages to the home were. Was there a prior deposition on uh, of this expert? Yes. And did that, did that deposition cover causation? Yes, I believe it did. So the issue was, in that situation where the pretrial order is limiting us to only one expert per specialty, and he's our guy, um, says he went out there, he identifies some chalking in one picture, you know, instead of saying, okay, limit your testimony to your prior inspection, um, the, the court, in, in my opinion, and in, in the case law is legion when you have just one expert on your specialty. Well, I mean, it, it seems from the record that the trial court was very angry at the non-disclosure and reacted to the non-disclosure. Am I wrong on that? No, you're not wrong. And... You know, that that seems that that's what happened. And uh, at what point did you folks say that his testimony should only be partially stricken? Um, 
I think we were arguing that it should be limited to his original testimony. Um, but what was going on was Mr. Alvarez was on the phone trying to find out if we even had received this letter, um, which was never resolved. And as a result, she went ahead and said, oh, he's changed his opinion. But he hadn't changed his opinion. His opinion was this was caused by the hurricane. Um, it really was looking at one picture. But the problem with, is when you read his testimony, and, and you read his all the way up through to where he admits he went back and took a look that he didn't disclose, is he said, well, I don't remember any co my conversations with the homeowner. Um, I don't remember any of the specific. He basically says, I don't remember the specifics that were on my takeoff sheet as to why I concluded that this, these damages that were listed were hurricane-related, except that they were consistent with hurricane damage that occurred in other places uh, nearby within a mile radius from Wilma. Then he had to backtrack and say, well, Wilma or Katrina, or I can't, script, I can't tell you Wilma versus Katrina. So he basically backtracked against all of that. And then when it came time to tie him down to, okay, let's talk about the specific things you say were caused by Wilma. Because it's not just, oh, I have a piece of paper with 150 things listed that I say I think were caused by Wilma. Tell me how you get to this thing was caused by Wilma. And, and uh, other than saying, well, I don't have any recollection from back there. And it's, I mean, he's, he says, oh, well, I went and I started looking recently. And that's when the trial judge exploded because it had up to that point it had been, I don't recall much about why I decided these issues, these items came were Wilma caused. Right. And all of a sudden it's like I have a very good rec I I can tell you now. Well, when I went back and looked at the property and the trial judge said, Hold on. Hold on. You didn't disclose that, so we're not gonna let it in since you can't remember anything else from before that. It's you're done. Did I read that wrong, or did, is that well, what I she think basically that goes, did? I think that the issue is that she, he had testified based upon his prior estimate as to what the damages were that, that he saw that he the thought The amount of damage, us. no doubt, no doubt. And, and, and th that would have been a fact question for the jury as to the issue of whether or not he, he sufficiently covered the issue of causation. She didn't, she didn't even allow that well, to who, go forward. Well, who was going to cover causation if it wasn't him? Who well, was... The, the, the point is, I believe that he did because he had, he had testified as to his estimate as to the damages that he saw, and I think that they were consistent with the hurricane. Well, he said, I went out there three years and four months after the hurricane. The roof had already been repaired. I saw repairs to the roof. I talked to the homeowner. I, I made this list of things that happened in the area of the house where I thought, you know, that was, would be consistent with global right. damage. And here's the list of, of what I – and I didn't keep my notes. I don't remember – I didn't pull anything. I don't know the age of anything. I didn't do any backtrack. And I don't recall what the homeowners told me. And yeah, there was Hurricane, hurricane Wilma and Katrina damage in that area. You, you have to have causation. What goes to the jury? But that, I think that would, that would be enough. I mean, if they, that, if they had thought that that wasn't causation, then that would have been a directed verdict. That, 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 that's right. But that, that's my concern with what Judge Wells is pointing out. If causation was not at all, there was no evidence of it, the judge would have properly entered judgment on a directed verdict. What happened here is it went to the jury after having stricken the entirety of the expert's testimony. And we don't know what causation would have been testified with respect to the first visit because it was completely stricken. That's correct. And I believe that that was a draconian remedy under these circumstances. Except because all this came what, out on but, cross. He'd already testified. What, He'd already given you his full bore. But, had he not, or was he, go or was he going to, by the time he got to the point where he, where everything was stricken, he'd already, he'd already admitted that he didn't remember anything from the first time. No, I believe that based upon his original estimate, he had found that that was hurricane-related damages, and that was why he wrote the estimate that he did, okay? And the concern that I have is we had other evidence of the damage and what it was caused by, by way of the sworn proof of loss, for instance, which was, you know, sharpied out uh, because she said, well, I excluded him. So even though the homeowner attested to the fact that these were her damages and it was caused by the hurricane, um, I'm not going to let that in either. And then 
The court also wouldn't allow um, questioning of the defendant's corporate representative regarding the estimate of damages. Um, while other documents in their file came in, it prevented the corporate representative from testing about attesting to or testifying as to the sworn proof of loss that was also in their claim file, or even what they thought their exposure was, or from testifying as to a third party inspection report that had been prepared before the policy was issued that showed the pre hurricane uh, condition of the property. So it all causation was out, all damage was out. And so from striking the expert's testimony, she then went forward and basically, I mean, effectively was striking our pleadings. I mean, so that's really what it was. if it really were to go back, if it were to go back, <clears throat> you'd have all of that documentary evidence as to the pre-insurance review of the home. Right. You'd have the homeowners, I don't know if the, the homeowner testified. Yes. And his proof of loss, which is really just his statement under oath as to what he claims he lost to Sarah Hurricane. And you'd have this witness's testimony. And photographs. Basically just the estimate. And photographs. Okay. Which were all of the photographs but nothing, he testified nothing, to were out. Nothing have it with him. I mean, he couldn't go back because before this testimony because now he's locked in. But he, he, I believe he went through his photographs in talking the, the about the The expert causation. was admitting photographs? Yes. I thought the expert hadn't seen the photographs from what date? From his original deposition. Not that I recall them being in this. I don't recall. I mean, did, did, did the expert took photographs on his 2009 visit to the subject property? Excuse me, Your Honor? Did, did the expert take photographs of the subject property when he visited the property in 2009? That was my understanding. I don't think he did. I think he testified he didn't have any photographs, and he didn't have his original notes, his take, uh, and, and so he had. No, his. because remember, at the time that he was being impeached, opposing counsel showed him a photograph, and he said, oh, there's chalking there. And it was the photograph he took on his re, uh, revisit. No, because he was, he, no, because the, 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 the reason he was impeached was he said, remember when I showed you this photograph at the time of your original deposition, you couldn't identify what that is, but now you went back out there and now you're telling me it's chalking. So you've changed your opinion. Well, he hadn't changed his opinion. His opinion was this was hurricane damage. And so he well, changed his opinion in regard to chalking, I guess. Correct. And, but instead of just saying, okay, limited to your original you know, your, your original inspection, it was, everything's out. And then from that flowed all evidence of causation and damages that we could have possibly put in. Um, I guess one of the problems is I thought that the expert testified that um, he destroyed his notes from the original inspection. He couldn't recall, even though normally he would rely upon what the property owner told him regarding the condition of the property. He couldn't recall what the property owner had told him regarding the condition of the property, and he couldn't refer to his notes because he had destroyed them. I thought that's what he testified to. During your inspection, you didn't take photographs, correct? No. You didn't do any testing? No. And your estimate doesn't include any specific details concerning the damages that you observed. They are not included in the estimate. And he says, well, I, I don't remember talking to the owner, and I don't really remember the specifics of my original estimate. So basically, he didn't have any recollection about what he did originally. He didn't have any photos. He didn't have anything. But he was testifying based on his re-visit re of the house. And the trial judge found out that. She said, well, what do you know from the first time? Nothing. All you know is about what you just went out, and it's different from the first time. And I think that's why she said. She well, I think that the, during his deposition, he was questioned about photographs of the property and the issue was he was saying oh I, it's, I recognize it as chalking now because I went back out there but he, he certainly testified as to photographs during the time of his deposition um, maybe someone else's photographs yes you also mentioned that a third party report concerning the condition of the property was not admitted that's correct wouldn't right. that be hearsay I mean did you try to call the the person who made the report as a no actually witness? um one of the things we raised on the appeal on our last point was the testimony of their corporate representative 
we were objecting to certain documents coming in that were computer generated, and we didn't believe that they were properly established in the case law that I've cited in my brief. But okay, if you're going to allow all that in, then let's talk to the corporate. You know, this is their their litigation specialist. I think they call them. And let us go in and let's go through um, these same things that the judge was freely letting in as business records. One of these things showing the prior condition of the property right before the hurricane is something that's in there. And now all of a sudden, that's no longer a business record. That's no longer kept in the ordinary course of business by citizens. Their sworn proof of loss that she excluded is now no longer something that's kept in the ordinary course of business. The estimate, their thought of what their exposure in the case was. Now all of a sudden, Everything that was being let, let in on direct, based on the business records exception, even though we had objected to it, now all of a sudden it's not coming in. So if it's all business records that she has in there, and one of these things is, is a piece of evidence that's showing what the property was in its condition prior to the hurricane, and now we're not going to let that but in along what, with the other items. I mean, if it was a third party's report, you could have called the third party as a witness. That's correct, but we didn't... At, that's correct, Your Honor. And had we known that the trial judge was going to strike our sole expert um, with regard to this the pretrial order, we had only one specialty, um, and that that was going to happen, then yes. But at, at that time, we weren't going to be able to, you know, bring in a, a new witness that wasn't listed on a, on a pretrial order. Um, it, How did your expert know the condition of the property prior to the storm if he couldn't remember it? I mean... Well, he's, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. He's, um, he goes out. He's, he does appraisals. He does uh, public adjusting. Well, I know, but for um, the subject property, I mean, I, I understand. Right. But I mean, for but the subject property, it would seem to me you'd want to know the condition of the property before the storm and compare it to the condition of the property after the storm. Right. And I guess he testified. I normally find that out because you know not everybody visits every property. Right. I normally find that out by asking the property owner. It's a completely legitimate way, but I thought he testified. I couldn't remember what the property owner told me. Yes, I believe that's what Judge Wells yeah, said. And then he testified. also said he didn't remember anything about the initial inspection, that he didn't recall any specifics on page 67 of the transcript. Okay, but he had, he had testified as to... So his only inspection of the property was the, you know, the, the, the one right before trial, it seems. Well, he put together his estimate based upon his initial... Uh, inspection, um, and he had that. But the estimate didn't include any details about causation, and he admits he didn't remember anything about what went on back then. That's the problem. Uh, I understand. Council, we've let you go way over time. Let's hear from the appellee. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Ann Sullivan Magnalia of Scott and Cassane on behalf of the Appellee Citizens Property Insurance Company. Your Honors must affirm the final judgment. Well, why couldn't this have gone? Why couldn't his testimony up to the time when he was beginning to say this estimate, these things, these different items he were uh, caused by Wilma based on things that I saw yesterday or last week or whenever it was recently that he had gone out and looked at the property. Why hadn't he, why hadn't what he said up to that time, wasn't that adequate to go to the jury? Why shouldn't the jury have, he said, I went out there, I wrote this thing out, I don't recall why I did it at the time, but uh, I would say that, that uh, what I saw was consistent with <clears throat> Hurricane Wilma and or Katrina damage. Well, Your Honor, the question of causation and damages did go to the jury, but well, not his, with that testimony. His entire didn't. testimony was stricken in whole because his entire testimony before he got to, I went out here a few days before trial, was just speculative. It was well, but that's not the basis for it. That, that, the the basis. problem, the, there's no doubt, in my mind at least, that the trial court erred in striking the entirety of the witness's testimony. There's, in my mind, that's not even up for discussion. Whether you win or not really is a tipsy coachman issue that the trial court aired, but it was okay and it was right for the wrong reason because when we read the transcript of the first inspection, there's not really much there on which the jury could have possibly ruled in favor of the appellants. Well, and put it another way, they have to show that there was some sort of harmful error, not just an abuse of discretion, and right. that it was harmful to strike the right. second opinion, or the entire opinion, because the first part 
And, and I do think, Your Honor, it doesn't show anything. He says, I had found that there was $50,000 worth of damages. And you can't just strike part of that opinion because it's not like saying a medical opinion, you know, I, th- I had four findings. He hurt his knee for this reason. He well, also the court could have, could have clearly done that. The court could have clearly informed the jury to disregard the entirety of the expert's testimony with respect to the second visit and only, only consider what testimony involved the first visit. But Mr. Quintana was there to testify about what what damages to the house were caused by Hurricane Wilma. And his first visit didn't uh, uh, well, say... But, but that's right. At that point, the trial court would have simply limited and said, that's the testimony. But he's, his first opinion, his first opinion, if we put it that way, was $50,000. But he doesn't say, I crawled up into the attic and it was this bubbling. He, did, he wasn't able to relate anything. So I think that's a red herring to say that he that could have been stricken in part. The testimony could have been stricken in part because his opinion was as to was what was caused by Hurricane Wilma and what was the amount. They go hand in hand, and he he only came in in his deposition. And, Your Honor, um, plaintiff's counsel said that in his deposition that he was, that Mr. Quintana talked about correlation. He didn't talk about correlation. That was the entire point of the prejudice that occurred in trial to citizens. Because in his deposition, Mr. Quintana talked about $50,000. He said, I, I don't quite know what I'm basing it on. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Well, there's no but doubt that my house could probably use $50,000 worth of renovations, and I could detail them to the nth degree. The question is, could I tie the necessity of those to a hurricane? So you're saying that his testimony, that there's nothing there's nothing in his testimony up till the up time page when he crossed when he, right. that, that ties the, the items that he says need to be fixed at this home to this hurricane. There's nothing in his testimony that ties it to Hurricane Wilma. And in fact, he was referring to Katrina, then Wilma, and he said, you know, all I know basically, I'm paraphrasing, is that there was $50,000 worth of damages. When Mr. Cabeza, trial counsel, started to get into the whys and wherefores, how are you tying this 50000 in? That's when he said, oh, you know how I'm tying it in? From my second visit that I just took the other day secretly. So he, even before that, he wasn't talking about anything which the jury could properly have considered. There would have had to be a verdict for the defendants on causation and damages because he was talking about speculative things, saying there was $50,000 worth of damages like a, a, an invoice, but he wasn't talking about it being tied to Hurricane Wilma. So even before we get to striking him as a sanction or not a sanction, and I don't think it was only punitive. I think it was based on Binger. But in the trial, judge was angry. Judge Cortina, as you asked, that was the trial judge. Angry. Oh no, Judge, judge Butchko she clearly was, was upset. She thought but games were being played, but, and that's why she struck the entirety of the testimony. There's no doubt. I don't think she only struck it based on her anger, though. The McKenna case out of the she, courts. She, she did absolutely no legal analysis whatsoever. I mean, that's clear in the transcript. This case doesn't involve any legal analysis other than. Discovery violation and prejudice. Surprise and prejudice, which is a legal analysis. I, well, that's it. But that's it. Nothing more than that. But the striking, and it would normally be error to have stricken the entirety of the testimony. But because for the fact that here aware, he would not have proven anything even for the, from the beginning of his we testimony. Go, we go back to the question whether it was harmful. And also the question whether there was a request for a cure. There was no request, hey, judge, strike only this portion of his testimony. If you, if your honors read pages, it's in the appendix, pages 25 and 26, trial court transcript pages 97 through 104. There's not a request, hey, just strike his testimony pre when he t- starts talking about going out the other day. So the, the judge was not presented with an opportunity to cure what is alleged to be error here. And there was no motion for new trial. There was not a motion to set aside the judgment. So the judge wasn't even given an opportunity to confront this alleged error and fix it, which I think means that we have to view this through the prism of was this, was this fundamental, not just harmful, but fundamental harmful error, not would another judge have done it differently, but was this something that but for this, the verdict could not have been reached? And I don't think that that is the case. When we review Mr. Quintana's testimony up through page 97, and yes, the jury was told to disregard that testimony, but even if they had not been told to disregard it, up until that point, it was speculative. It had not tied anything at the house in particular into Hurricane Wilma in particular. And so the verdict... I don't know if they really could have asked for a limiting of the testimony the way the hearing went from page 113 on. I mean, the the judge is clearly uh, very upset at trial counsel, says numerous times that 
uh, striking the witness that she's outraged. It's just snowballing and snowballing. Uh, and, you know, she says over and over, I'm striking the entirety of his testimony and gives no room for any other possibility. Well, no argument was made to her, Your Honor. I don't know that. Possible. I think any argument made in this context would have landed any lawyer in contempt. There was no analysis in the initial brief of it would have been pointless or useless to ask for only part of the testimony to be stricken, and that is their error. I mean, I that is their you burden. You can always ask to preserve, preserve the record, Your Honor. We want to put, spread it on the record to preserve the record. That's not contemptible. You know, you have to reserve a record. Right. You I don't know, think you just can Just because decide. the judge is going to dump well, down there, I don't think there's any claim that they've waived this, that they, that they didn't object to this. I mean, they, they certainly objected to the striking. It's clear from the transcript that they did not want their witness to be stricken. No, no, no doubt. That. Right. No doubt. But they didn't uh, provide the judge with another choice. Hey, let's just strike Mr. Quintana from the point where he starts talking about going out to the house the other day. But even had they, going back and reading Mr. Quintana's testimony, and I would ask, it's not in the record, I just checked. His deposition testimony has not, not been filed as a matter of record. But that was the whole point when Mr. Cabeza brought it to the judge's attention. But it doesn't really Sidebar. matter what his deposition testimony is because it wasn't in the trial. Right. But it, neither did it correlate it to the, um, to the damages that were claimed. So there was no error striking his, uh, it, no harmful error striking his testimony in whole because even had the first portion of it been allowed to be heard, and it was heard, but we have to assume the jury disregarded it because they were instructed to do so. Whether they actually did or not, we have to assume they did. But had it been heard and allowed in, the verdict would have been the same. They didn't even get to damages, the, the, the jury. They checked off the first question, which is record page 424. Was there causation here? They said no. By the way, the plaintiff himself, the homeowner, was able to talk about causation and damages. So it's not as if they were just up there without a story in the closing argument, the way it's presented in the initial brief. They were allowed, you know, they were allowed to speak about what the plaintiff, the homeowner, testified to. Well, um, that makes your argument worse in a way. Because in that, way, that in a way it does, because that eliminates the idea that a directed verdict should have been entered in favor of citizens, right? Because if there was evidence of causation by the homeowner, then at least the first visit, but the, it, it ultimately boils down to the testimony of the expert in the first visit. It does. And he can't recall the conversation with the co-homeowner, and he can't recall the specifics. And this is a unique position because we don't have to think what would his testimony have been. It's here. There wasn't a proffer. Oh, it's we here. It. We know what it would have been. I ask your honors to affirm the final judgment, and um, the other points on appeal are without merit. They don't merit a reversal on their own. They were all abuse of discretion standard, and no showing of abuse of discretion was made. Thank you, your honors. Thank you, counsel. Counsel, two minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to address the second inspection um, because, first of all, they could have subpoenaed. There was no prohibition of a second inspection. But if you go back and you take a look at his testimony. I think the issue was surprise. I think uh, it was I, like, well, wait a minute, all well, of a sudden. I, I want to address that, Your Honor, because it wasn't surprise, and I'll tell you why. He testifies about the second inspection that they were supposedly surprised about. Where about, are you, counsel? I'm on uh, page 23 of Mr. Quintana's uh, testimony, starting at page 20, uh, line 24. How about the subsequent inspection? The subsequent inspection would have been with Craig Harrell. When you say page 23, do you mean which numbering system? I think it's record six. The appendix number six is. Page yeah, I'm looking at his his testimony of Mr. Uh, <coughs> Tink Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I'm, and I'm happy to answer your questions because I think this is very important with regard to this surprise issue. And hey, I didn't know about this, Your Honor. How about the subsequent inspection? This is on direct. The subsequent inspection would have been with Craig Harrell, who is the independent, I believe, hired, the independent adjuster, hired by citizens to conduct their evaluation of the property. Remember, I told you they went back out and did an inspection also. So I do remember meeting with Craig. Craig and I worked on many other losses. He was, you know, working for a firm that was an independent adjustment firm. And so we evaluated the property. After our evaluation of the property, we presented Craig directly with a fax copy or a copy of our estimate. So that was basically the extent of our evaluation at that point of the carrier's representative. So, and it goes on to talk about meeting with Mr. Harrell. So this idea that But that's, this, that's not necessarily the second inspection. Well, he's saying the subsequent inspection. But, that, but we don't know that it's the same one. Correct. I'm reading that to mean that was the subsequent one. Um, that was done. Um, and so I don't think that there was surprise. 
with regard to the — there was no — See, counsel, this seems to be, you know, after he met with Craig, then they forwarded their estimate, which would suggest it might have taken place earlier than the week before I, I understand your point, Your Honor. Um, so basically what I'm saying is there was nothing that prevented him from going back out and reinspecting that property. There, there, there wasn't. The, the problem was one of disclosing the evidence and the visit and so forth. Right. And, and to that extent, Your Honor, there was a letter which was never confirmed. We were trying — and I know you read the, the testimony and what was going on at that time. Mr. Alvarez was trying to confirm with Mr. Gomez whether we had ever received that letter with regard to wanting a follow-up deposition. There was no subpoena. It was an informal request. And so at that point in time, um, and I don't even think to this day we were able to answer that question as to whether that letter had been received by our office. And so there was nothing, again, preventing him from going back out there and doing that subsequent inspection. And they sent an informal letter, and the judge prior to even — and I think you're right, she was very upset I was there uh, — prior to even getting an answer, um, basically struck the witness and said, everything's out. It's gone. That's done. And then from that flowed the um, removal of all of the other evidence. Um, and so what I would request to this court is to allow Mr. Scano to have just have — his day in court with his witness and the calling of a witness and an expert witness is, who is your, your only witness in this one area of specialty to, to have his day in court and have his uh, right to present it fully to the jury. Um, and we'd ask that the court uh, reverse the ruling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you both. All right.